Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the International Center for Research on Women. We're delighted to see all of you here uh, in person, and we are welcoming many people from across the world uh, as we live stream uh, today's special event. Um, today is a very important day for ICRW in that we are making the 2019 Paula Cantor Award for Excellence in Field Research to one of two winners from 2019. And we are just delighted that Dr. Jocelyn Kelly does not live too far away and can come speak to us today about the work uh, that she has been doing uh, and brought her to the attention uh, of the award committee. Um, I am just delighted to introduce Marika Dupree who is a member of our board of directors, and she is chair of the ICRW Netherlands board. And uh, she will actually be making the award uh, today. We'll have some presentation uh, by Jocelyn, some opportunity for some conversation. We'll also be taking questions um, from the folks who are live streaming. And then as you can see, we've got some delicious things out there on the table so that you all can have a little bit of a libation and congratulate Jocelyn after the presentation. Okay, Marika, pleasure to introduce you. Yes, yes, <laughs> Jerkins Dupree, it all works. <laughs> um, in January of 2016, ICRW celebrated its 40th anniversary and at this time, the board decided to create an award for excellence in field research and to name it after our former colleague, Dr. Uh, Paula Cantor. Paula sadly died in the aftermath of a terrorist attack in Kabul, Af Afghanistan in May of 2015. Uh, and it was a tremendous loss for all of us. She was a leading expert on the intersection of gender and development um, and she was passionate about advancing the economic and social well being of women in low income and otherwise marginalized communities worldwide through applied research. In the spirit of Paula's legacy, the Paula Cantor Award recognizes and honors outstanding achievements by a young female researcher in the field of gender and the empowerment, empowerment of girls and women. Each year we receive a number of very impressive nominations and this year was no different. All candidates had extensive experience, strong methodology and innovative ideas. An internal committee screened all the nominees on the basis of their body of work and the top three candidates were then rated by an external committee of gender experts to select our winner. This year we had a tie and the two winners uh, were announced at our Champions for Change of Gala in London in March. And our winners for this year are, and I'm sure I'm going to say this wrong, Dr. Otibu Obiwano, is that, um, and Dr. Jocelyn Kelly. And we are delighted to have the opportunity to rec recognize Dr. Kelly in person. Uh, Jocelyn was nominated by her colleague Morgan Holmes at USAID for her research on women in mining communities and the need to provide greater safeguards against exploitation and abuse. Jocelyn developed a survey to look at layered vulnerabilities to understand the full complexity of women's lives in conflict-affected mining towns in, Eastern, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, highlighting the many forms of abuse and structural inequality faced by women engaged in small-scale mining. Jocelyn is the director, excuse me, the director for Harvard's humanitarian initiative, Women in War program, where she designs and implements projects to examine issues uh, relating to gender, peace, security, in and security in fragile states. Her work focuses on understanding and preventing gender-based violence and, hum and human trafficking in conflict settings. And it also focuses, focuses on understanding the attitudes and the, the experiences of rebels who perpetrate this violence in order to understand how best to prevent it. Jocelyn, thank you for your invaluable research contributions and all you do to make this world more equitable. On behalf of the International Center for Research on Women, I'm pleased to present you with the 2019 Paula Cantor Award. Thank you.
And I think you have to say something. <laughs> um, so I will actually get my real notes and I've brought a lot of slides in order to share my work with all of you today. But just on a personal note, I wanted to say that when I became aware of the award, I spent quite a bit of time reading and learning about um, Dr. Paula Cantor and her legacy. And I think um, it was eerie and touching and kind of brought home the incredible courage that people at ICRW and around the world bring to uh, the field of researching violence against women. I mean, it's such an, in so many ways, it's such an unsung pursuit and people put themselves in the way of danger all the time to go out and seek where um, women are most vulnerable, where problems are most hidden and the most remote places where we can do the best work. And, um, you know, I'm actually working on a project in Afghanistan this year. We talk to colleagues every single day who are out there in the field, putting themselves in just enormous danger in order to kind of elevate the voices of people who otherwise wouldn't have a global voice. And it's just um, really meaningful and striking to, to be here today. So, with that, I just wanted to say an enormous thank you to ICRW and to everyone who came here today and everyone who's joining online. And I cannot wait to tell you about the work and have your reflections on it in turn. So um, I think with that, I'll actually get my real notes and we can jump into the slides. make sure is this working Joe perfect okay so I'm gonna read from my notes for, <laughs> for a second just so I can warm up so um, I'm so grateful for the chance to be here and I have to say that ICRW's work and focus on evidence-based practice and policy change has been something I've admired my entire career so it's incredibly meaningful to be here with you in this room and to share some time with an organization that is fully and completely my biggest academic crush. So I have like a couple of butterflies in my stomach. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the research program that I run at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative itself. Um, this is a group that focuses on bringing strong evidence-based practice into humanitarian contexts in order to better protect and support those affected by crisis. And I think for a long time in the kind of arc of humanitarianism, people believed that in times of instability, it was more important to react than to gather evidence about what works to help populations in crisis. And HHI, like ICRW, believes the opposite. We believe that when people are facing the most complex problems in the most challenging places, it's more important than ever to look for proven solutions and to elevate the voices of those most affected, just like Dr. Cantor was trying to do. So today I'm so excited to have the chance to present this particular work to this particular audience. And um, because of that, because I'm so excited to leverage the expertise in the room, I'm going for a twofer. So I packed two different projects into this um, presentation because I would love your feedback on both. Um, so the first project was the fieldwork that was nominated for this award, and the second builds on some of the unexpected findings that emerged from the first research project. Um, I even practiced clicking <laughs> earlier. I'll get it. I'll get it right. One of these points. So the first project I'm presenting relates to measuring human rights abuses in artisanal mining towns in the conflict-affected region of Eastern DRC. Here, you can see women, men, and children panning for gold in one of these sites. And as you can also see, it can be a chaotically and chaotic and physically demanding environment. Artisanal and small-scale mining refers to informalized and often illegal subsistence mining done independently from large companies. In DRC, small-scale mining is a vital economic driver, but as the picture shows, these are complex workplaces with unique challenges compared to formal operations. Small-scale mining is often rudimentary, 
labor intensive, and has few to no safeguards for human safety and human rights. Add to this challenge the fact that small scale mining in Eastern DRC is often done in some of the most remote and dangerous sites in the country because DRC has been embroiled in a protracted conflict since the late 1990s. It's a war that has become known for its brutality and high rates of sexual violence against women. But during this time, artisanal and small scale mining emerged as a powerful economic driver, even though so many abuses occur within the sector. And though the protracted conflict actually eroded the agricultural and subsistence farming industry through displacement, mass looting, insecurity, and market deterioration, as farming collapsed, mining gained ascendancy. And it provides one of the few sources for um, ongoing economic art opportunity for both women and men. So there are about 100 mining sites, mostly unregistered in this part of the country. It's highly conflict affected. There's gold, cassiterite, tantalite, wolframite, and precious gemstones. And 400 to 550,000 people directly engage in this sector, with many more providing support um, roles around, and many of those people who are engaged in this sector are in fact women. So as the protracted conflict drew on in DRC, Many NGOs, governments, and advocacy groups began to question what financial mechanisms were being leveraged to allow the war to continue. In the 2000s, advocacy groups lobbied to ensure that the mineral supply chain profits coming from sites like this did not fund armed groups or exacerbate human rights abuses. There was particular concern that people seeking work in mining towns were actually enslaved or victims of human trafficking and particularly being enslaved by the many armed actors in this area. One NGO that focused specifically on human slavery published a memorable report in which they determined that almost all people in mining sites were enslaved based on a visual inspection of the mine from afar. At the same time, USAID was trying to decide what their engagement would look like in Eastern DRC for the next five years. And understandably, there was a desire to inject some evidence into what was a very emotionally charged debate. So um, they reached out to me because I'd already been working in um, these areas for almost a decade and particularly with women's rights groups. So here's the challenge. There is intense advocacy narratives around slavery perpetrated by armed groups in mining towns, but there's no real data and there's no best practices around measuring human trafficking. So how do you measure a hidden and difficult to define concept in a conflict zone, in complex, hard to access dynamic sites in a way that requires asking incredibly sensitive questions around forms of exploitation that are often hidden and may not be well understood? So um, a great place to start is the touchstone of the WHO ethical guidelines on conducting research with women in um, humanitarian contexts, and so we certainly started there and tried to um, ensure all of those safeguards were present. We had um, male and female interviewers, referrals to um, sexual violence services and health clinics, as, one, as well as mental health support. We conducted private interviews. This was us carrying the paper surveys in the field with our team. You know, we often had our team in a uh, four by four vehicle and then moved to motorbikes and then from the motorbikes we had put the surveys kind of on our backs and travel off into um, the bush to find these very remote sites. Um, but even more challenging than the logistical questions was the intellectual question of how do you go about measuring human trafficking? Um, and I decided to draw on lessons from the field of violence against women and use the best practices that had been established already to measure highly sensitive issues. So as many of you know in this room, we never go up to a woman and ask, are you a victim of intimate partner violence? Because often people in abusive situations are unable to self-identify as victims of this abuse and unable to disclose it. So instead, we use something called the conflict tactic scale, which I'm sure almost everyone in this room is aware of. And that asks about a number of very specific actions and experiences and then uses the responses about whether you've been exposed to these experiences to measure whether you're exposed to intimate partner violence and the severity of that 
So we decided to use a similar approach in our work and to identify all of the elements or experiences that might take an, make an individual vulnerable to different forms of trafficking, which is a concept that has a number of distinct elements um, that go into it. So a person must be recruited through force, fraud, or coercion. They must be forced to work against their will and also feel that they can't leave that situation without threats or violence to them or their family. So we looked also at multiple forms of trafficking, which includes labor and sex trafficking and debt bondage, and tried to take the broadest possible definition. So we would capture anyone who not only had this experience, but might be at risk of it as well. And finally, and very fortunately, in discussions with our team, and this is really a huge credit to USAID and the approach that they felt that they were able to take, we decided to move the focus solely from trafficking and slavery to examine multiple forms of abuse and exploitation, such as sexual violence, coercion, intimidation, and economic abuse. So when we finally rolled out the survey, we were able to conduct 1,500 surveys in um, over 32 sites, with a full quarter of the respondents being women. This was actually a huge accomplishment because a lot of times it's really hard to find women in these mining sites and identify them. It's a highly male-dominated profession, and in all previous work, less than 5% of the respondents were actually women. So we started constructing outcomes um, in, in the most kind of thoughtful way we, we could think of. And I apologize for this horrifically tiny font. I'll actually read it to you. But if you take nothing else away, the idea is that we took the responses from different questions and tried to construct what it might look like if you were labor trafficked or in debt bondage. So, um, on the top line, briefly, um, for labor trafficking, we looked at whether someone had been brought into mining through force, fraud, or coercion, or had been forced to work by actions or threats, and in the second box over, didn't feel free to leave their job or experienced a restricted freedom of movement. And if they responded yes to any of those questions, they were um, determined to be at risk of or have been labor trafficked. On the bottom line, we looked at um, debt bondage. So this was um, if someone had debts, if they didn't feel capable of paying them off, and if they didn't feel free to leave their job or had had their um, movement restricted. But the most interesting thing about this is even when we kind of cast the net as broadly as we could and um, started you know, counting people who had at any point um, felt that they might not be able to leave their job, we actually found um, really low numbers of um, trafficking and slavery. So for labor trafficking, we had about 3.7% of respondents. For debt bondage, 2.6%. For sex trafficking, less than 1%, um, which was surprising to us. Um, and so here are some of those numbers again. What we did find was that, in fact, the other forms of abuse that we measured were far more common than restriction of movement, uh, slavery, or trafficking, and that they differentially impacted women vastly more than men. So you can see here more than a quarter of women were forced to trade sex simply for access to protection, to work, or for food. And a third of women report, reported having to engage in transactional sex just to make enough money to live. We also found something else that was even more surprising. When we asked who was perpetrating these abuses, we found that it was not armed groups. It was actually village and customary chiefs, the man who owned the mining tunnel, or family members and acquaintances. So there had been an assumption all along that the violence and the abuses that were occurring were because of armed actors. And it's not to say these are not significant perpetrators. They are. But we were completely overlooking and therefore not holding accountable everyone else who was complicit in creating these environments. So we have to acknowledge certainly that conflict helped create the conditions that allowed these abuses to occur. But these changes were reflected in what we often think of as non-conflict related violence. So just to hammer home all of the findings, human trafficking was not the most common or pressing type of exploitation women were massively differentially impacted by the kinds of abuses that did occur, and that civilians were the primary perpetrators of violence. So if we had created programming just to address human trafficking, we would have missed the vast majority of abuses, 
And partly as a result of this work, USAID's five-year funding plan for DRC involved undertaking holistic violence prevention activities that addressed multiple forms of GBV in communities, as well as the stigma associated with seeking services. And it moved away from this kind of very narrow focus on slavery itself. So the protracted conflict has created vulnerabilities and abuses well beyond those we traditionally think of as conflict related. Um, and the second project I wanted to present to you was, is there a way to look further into this? Because as I personally continued to work in DRC, I became seized with this question of how does conflict change communities in unexpected, lasting, and often very invisible ways? This is the question that set me on a newer research trajectory and brings me to the second part of the presentation, where I want to tell you about some of the work that I've been undertaken to look more closely at how um, conflict can change important societal dynamics, and in some cases may hide equally worrying trends in violence. So the next project I'd like to tell you about formed the basis of my dissertation research and is now a continuing kind of body of work. So like diseases and many other complex social phenomena, violence can actually be transmitted across individuals, groups, generations, and different levels of societal organization. And some studies show that individuals who experience conflict may be more likely to go on and perpetrate or experience violence themselves. But little research to date explores whether simply residing in a conflict-affected place can be associated with higher levels of violence in the post-conflict period. So this map shows areas of the world that have currently or recently experienced war. And as you can see, much of the globe shows up in color. The 40 most unstable countries in the world are home to 38% of the globe's population. Annually, violence is one of the leading causes of death for people in their most productive years. Globally, um, roughly one third of violence related deaths are attributed to interpersonal violence like intimate partner violence or um, violence against children. And one fifth of deaths um, attributed to violence are attributed to war. So despite the fact that all forms of violence are a significant burden on human health, the links between the different forms of violence are not fully understood. There are, however, oh, I broke it. There are, however, <laughs> a limited number of surveys that show that if a woman herself experiences abuses during war, such as being abducted or experiencing sexual violence, that same woman is much more likely to experience abuse in her own home during and after conflict. But this project wanted to ask a slightly different question. Um, and it's a question that's not currently addressed in the literature. Does simply living in a conflict affected place also make a woman more at risk of experiencing violence during and after war? So does that make sense? You know, we've seen that, you know, women abducted themselves can then be ostracized and treated poorly in her community, but is there something that changes in a neighborhood or a town that has been conflict affected that also makes women more vulnerable? So we already saw from the previous project that conflict can occlude, hide, or morph other kinds of violence. So how can we begin to measure this interesting but kind of challenging question? Um, so I decided to use two data sets. One is from political science and one is from public health. And the two data sets hadn't actually been combined before, but they both had geographic identifiers that allow you to stitch them together to uh, look at information both about conflict intensity and about individual outcomes. Um, I wanted to use past year intimate par partner violence as the outcome of interest because that is measured in the public health data set. And I decided to look at three recently conflict-affected countries, Kenya, Liberia, and the Ivory Coast. Um, so the first data set I used might be familiar to you guys. It's called the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data, or ACLED. And it provides information about the intensity of conflict in over 50 countries. Um, it's incredibly comprehensive, very systematic. Having said that, and if you kind of wonder sometimes why this kind of research doesn't happen more often, I was in a public health program for my dissertation, and my advisor actually made me take a screenshot of their website because in the public health community, we just 
don't know this data exists. And she kind of didn't believe that there was this much information about conflict out there. So in an annex, I actually had pictures of this data and had to cite um, articles that this had been used by other scholars. So the second data set I have a feeling is familiar to a lot of people in this room. It's the demographic and health survey data set. And that measures individual level outcomes, particularly among women, looking at um, their exposure to violence. The exciting thing about this is that a DHS is seldom ex conducted in a country that is in current war. But very shortly after peace is declared, the DHS will come in and look at the health outcomes in that population. And so what you actually have is ACLED busily measuring war when it's happening. And then very shortly after war is over, DHS enumerators come in and ask women about intimate partner violence. So among the three countries that we are looking at, we have a lag of between one year and five years later, we, we begin to um, see how individuals are affected. Uh, we don't have to spend too much time on this, but it's just a brief note to say that um, this uses a nested modeling approach, a multi-level modeling approach. So it looks at how women are nested within districts that are affected by conflict. And I just wanted to share briefly with you some of these results and then open it up to discussion. But what we found was um, that um, when we looked at the levels of intimate partner violence in Kenya and Liberia, comparing a district with any conflict fatalities versus no conflict fatalities at all, we found that women were more than 50% more likely to experience intimate partner violence, so not war-related violence, even years after conflict was over. When we split the level of conflict into low, medium, and high levels, we found that women living in those highest, most conflict-affected districts were between 70 and 250 percent more likely to experience intimate partner violence in conflict-affected countries. So what are the implications of this work? You know, studies have previously looked at the connection between war and post-conflict violence, but they focused on the individuals and individuals that had been specifically affected by conflict. Um, these might be really vulnerable populations like demobilizing soldiers or women abducted by armed groups. But this work suggests that simply living in a conflict-affected place may also be associated with an increased risk of violence even years after a conflict is officially over. So um, this is one of the first efforts to quantify the spread of violence after a conflict. And in doing so, these findings, I think, point to opportunities for intervention. So post-conflict peace building and reconciliation can incorporate domestic violence and violence against children messaging into their efforts. As we actually know from some really exciting work from ICRW, um, intimate partner violence and violence against children are actually very, very closely linked. And a failure to address IPV can lead to cycles of violence that affect children and generations long after formal war has been declared over. Um, trauma healing programs with former combatants and highly affected groups can target aggression within the home on, and focus on conflict resolution, de-escalation of violence, and behavior modification. It's important because currently in our world, the levels of political violence are among the highest since World War II, and worldwide conflicts are increasing dramatically since 2012. So understanding how we can not only look at the war-related violence, but the violence that begins to emerge in the post-war period, specifically address it and find ways to help societies rebuild in healthier ways um, is critical for achieving a sustained recovery and helping the voices of women kind of gain ascendancy in post-conflict societies. So with that, I will hand it over and open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. This has been really fascinating. And um, it's incredibly compelling work. When I first got into this field in public health, my first was when the conflict in the Great Lakes was taking place. And so mm -hmm. on the one hand, it's incredibly sad that we're still witnessing the aftermath of, of decades of displacement and economic, economic struggles. Mm -hmm. And 
and land disputes, but incredible to see the work continuing to grow and, and deepen our understanding of conflict and how it affects its gendered drivers and, and how, it, how we can find other ways to intervene. So with that, uh, thank you so much. Um, questions from the audience? I stand here with a, with a mic. Hi, um, I thought this is very interesting work. Um, oh, I'm Abby, uh, I'm with the Feminist Majority Foundation. Um, so I wanted to ask, so you found that there's a significant effect on women by just being in these conflict zones. Do you think it's because like, like with the intimate partner violence, do you think it's because like being in such sustained violence for so long, like it breaks down social norms that might not have been acceptable before maybe? Yeah, 100%. And because it's a required element of any PhD, you have to make a conceptual model. And, you know, look at all of the things that might feed into exactly this kind of question, right? What are the things that change during conflict that then allow IPV to become so ascendant? And I think you're exactly right. You know, one of the things that we looked at was um, uh, cognitive behavioral theories of change and whether just witnessing violence and honestly witnessing violence as, a, and as an effective way to achieve your ends then becomes ingrained in a society that says, well, maybe that's how it works. But I also think there's a lot more going on. You have a breakdown of um, traditional structures that actually sanction men when they become too violent. You have a breakdown of formal legal structures. Um, and uh, one of the biggest parts of my work, and I would actually love to bring this to the group, is the sense that in public health, we got really excited about and interested in behavior change communication as like the lever you pull to change outcomes for women. And like, to be honest, a lot of times the form that takes is billboards or workshops and telling people, you know, you shouldn't beat your wife, here's ways to have better dynamics within your home. And I'm not being facetious, I think it's it's important to do that kind of awareness raising. But I've also begun to wonder, in places with such extraordinarily high amount of trauma and um, kind of social disintegration, whether just telling people to change their behavior is actually the most effective way to help them recover. And so one of the things we're looking at now with USAID is something called community-based trauma healing. So along with the behavior change communication, you say, we understand how unbelievably angry you must feel having seen all the things that you've seen. And we want to help you understand what trauma feels like, how that anger can be expressed in healthier ways, and some pathways to recovery, both for women and men, but particularly for men. I think that there's a often socialized response to having emotions is to become violent. Like that's the appro you know, appropriate way that you can have an outlet. And, um, and so I think we get at this question of what are all the things that go into increasing intimate partner violence against women and how do we actually try to effectively address these and what are the most effective tools that we can bring to bear in the public health field? To, to address some of this. But it's an amazing question. I would actually love any of your reflections on that as well. But yeah. Hi, I'm Casey. I'm with the Slaves. First of all, congratulations, Jocelyn. Um, I know Jocelyn from my work at Hopkins as well. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question about, um, you mentioned something about forced marriage, I noticed in your first study, and how you measured that. And then the second question was, um, just looking at how you, the role of gatekeepers in the study and how you went about like recruiting and um, just getting your, I guess, for your surveys, your sample population. Yeah. Um, hi, Casey. <laughs> it's so nice to see you in ages. Um, so yeah, those are two amazing questions. And um, maybe it's, in terms of forced marriage, we found this a really interesting thing to try to measure and took both kind of, um, a neighbor approach to measuring where we said, have you ever seen forced marriage occur at any point in your life just to try to get a sense of the um, <clears throat> levels that it might be happening at, whereas people you know, might be much less likely to report it in their own family. And we actually had almost 10% of people said that they were aware of or had seen forced marriage. So certainly at relatively high levels. And then we had a very small proportion of people actually reporting that for themselves. So maybe 1.8%. Um, but for both, people said that the people, the person forcing the marriage, you know, was a civilian actor and almost always a family member. 
you know, and so, and I think we just always turn to armed groups as the ones perpetrating abuses, but we forget that conflict is an overlay on a society that already has sometimes these practices that were pre-existing as well. Um, and the question about gatekeepers is so important. I actually would love to have a quick note about methodology in general. So mining sites are interesting because they're like unbelievably dynamic. You can have a site existing one day and the next day if minerals dry up, everyone's gone. Thousands of people can just disappear overnight. And so what we did is we went in and did a huge amount of awareness raising and actually did mini censuses um, among the sites that allowed us to conduct the research. And you know, given the context, we always started with um, male customary and community leaders, moved on to female uh, rights leaders and got buy-in from all of these folks and then actually had them create like estimates or censuses of the kinds of humans they had at their site at that particular point in time. And then from those lists, we sampled, um, and that's how we were able to get as many women as we did to respond. Um, it's a great question about the gatekeeping, though, because the last thing that you want to do is expose people to um, kind of retribution or um, negative consequences once you leave. So we did revisit the sites that we did the work in and, and hadn't heard too much about negative consequences because I think partly life in mining is really hard. And a lot of times people are actually pretty eager to share some of the challenging experiences that they face. And particularly the male miners had a lot to say about their health and safety outcomes. And so people tended to be pretty positive about taking those surveys, but it was a very sensitive environment. It took a lot of groundwork to just gain entree and then to kind of move forward with that. We also worked with an incredible local research forum called Research Initiatives for Social Development. They've been working in mining town for ages. And with me, actually, we'd been working together for over a decade in these areas. And when we went back, we actually knew a lot of the folks who were there. And, and I think that helps as well, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Greg, do you have questions online? Uh, yes, I have a question. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, should I, should I sit here? Um, hello, namaste. Uh, congratulations, Kelly. It's uh, wonderful that you, you know, the work really deserves. And, um, you know, coming from India, I was actually looking at, you know, uh, our country seems to qualify to be called conflict, uh, mm. you know, driven all the time, actually, if you look at the way in which our, you know, I mean, several of our social norms, the family structure, everything, and forced marriage is something which is seen as a norm you know i mean and so it's it's a it's abnormal or extraordinary to be choosing your own partner you know i mean i remember 20 years ago when i married i fought for it and uh, you know we live uh, happily you know live ever after like any couple could do but uh, you know my, uh, my i can see several similarities in the way which you have gone about the work with the work that we've been doing with the missing girls you know and I want to ask you, uh, have you found instances where, uh, you know, you've, you've, have you been able to trace any of those missing girls or missing women? Uh, because, you know, I mean, that's something which is happening very, very, you know, it's like a rampant infectious, literally, all over the world. It's not just here, not just in Congo, but in uh, across the world, we are finding that girls and women who are walking across the street today are tomorrow uh, literally not found and you really do and the percentage is increasing uh, and we can't uh, i mean unfortunately the boys and the men are also not spared so here you find uh, a very uh, you know difficult matrix to decipher when we look at uh, the research methodology so did you ever like you know how were the social parameters how did you look at them what were the other social uh, indicators that you looked into and uh, you know, what came out from that and what are the further, you know, the suggestions or recommendations that you would see? Because we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, areas of intervening with the school, which we are doing in a very uh, a pilot way. But of course, when I say pilot in India, it is like around 12,000. <laughs> so I must say that it's a major one. <laughs> OK, so uh, we are looking at how we can intervene with the school system. Uh, to, I'm, I mean, it's not easy. We can't go into the school system saying that we are empowering women or 
we are talking about gender because it's not uh, taken so easily. So we are working on the agency aspect very, right. very strongly, be it the man or the woman or the boys and girls. So uh, sexual intimidation or sexual abuse is uh, almost seen as uh, like, I mean, one of our uh, students did a survey which was like almost 97% of the ones that was her sample was around 300, 400, uh, you know, uh, people and 97% uh, of them had uh, experienced very severe uh, sexual abuse. And again, it was not by the unknown, but the known. Yeah. So that is very strongly validated. And I really appreciate you for bringing that about. So what are the areas that you see as a challenge when you were working? you know, in terms of research methodology. And, uh, you know, the, uh, also about, you know, uh, if you could share your work, which is, of course, uh, uh, apart from the one which is online, but others which you have, uh, I would really like to take back to my university. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Every academic loves when someone offers to read their work. So um, that's amazing. And thank you for that very rich question. I have a couple of thoughts. One is, you know, just that idea of, missing people and it's something that we see everywhere from Juarez, Mexico to um, what really came out for me when you were talking is mining towns are actually usually a catchment area for missing girls in Congo, right? Because what we've seen is that, again, you have those cycles of vulnerability. So a lot of times these are young women who face abuse at home or have been kicked out of their homes because they were victims of sexual violence in the war and they're seen as um, unclean, the family doesn't want want to deal with the mental and um, physical health problems that they face. And mining towns are one of the only areas that they can go and seek a living and try to, you know, have the sense of dignity and agency through work. And then the heartbreak is that they're also some of the most unbelievably dangerous and exploitative places as well. But the point is that women seek work in those areas knowing the full panoply of problems that they're going to face there and then the question becomes as an international community are we going to take that away and say you know it's it's too dangerous for you you can't do that and i think the answer is no but the what we can do especially as researchers is to try to elevate their voices to say so rather than doing programming that doesn't fit your needs at the very least we can try to create opportunities for you recognizing all of um, the vulnerabilities that you do face. So I think a lot of the women and girls in mining towns are actually missing women and girls from their communities, right? And they end up in these very, very migrant places with um, uh, kind of feeble social structures. But, you know, on just to have a higher note or to, to inject a, a note of hope, one of the projects I'm working on now is looking at... Um, mechanisms of women's self-organization in these places. And it is <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, these are women who have nothing to their name. A lot of times they have to share clothing items because they don't have enough clothing. And they have set up rotating savings and loans. They've set up um, communal child care systems so women can take turns working while someone watches all of the kids together. They have banded together to protect women from harassment. So basically, if a woman is targeted for harassment because she won't exchange sex for access to the mines, all of the women will come together and protect her. Um, in that way, it's almost this idea of like, just the strength in numbers, right? Um, and they have all of these, these other mechanisms that they then employ to kind of um, uh, face down these huge power structures that they're up against. Another is they will self-form into associations. And in DRC, they're, you know, very interesting kind of differences between a cooperative, which is a formalized and highly respected organization versus an association, which is like, oh, it's just vulnerable people holding meetings, right? But by forming these associations, actually women become really powerful. They often elect a chef mayor, like a mother chief, and that mother chief will hold to task um, male leadership because you know women are providing life-saving support functions in these mining towns and people can't survive without it. So I think one of the most fascinating parts of the work is just seeing how resilient uh, women can be in these areas and how much they can draw on each other uh, to, to find strength. Um, 
another thing I was just going to say, again, related to the idea of missing people, I was just on a panel with someone from IOM, and they had uh, highlighted for me that they have a, um, I think it's called the Missing Migrant Project, and you can actually go online in this interactive tool and um, trace all of the migrants, you know, frankly, in a very timely <clears throat> political note, trace all the migrants who are seeking a better life and actually disappear during the process of seeking that. So I ju just to kind of emphasize the importance of this point that you're bringing up. Hi, my name is Nanette Barkey, and um, I did some similar work on trauma and um, healing and health in Angola and Mozambique mm -hmm. after the war. Um, and I have two questions for you about sample size and then one um, bigger question. The first one is about, so you had around 40 people, women in the first survey, right? If you, I figured if you have 25% of 1,500, mm -hmm. right? 25% of 1,500, now I'm going to have to go. 400 yeah, four. okay so then the um then the the numbers you gave in that one slide about like um you were talking about how many heads labor trafficking debt yeah, bondage right so that was women and men so those were actually male uh including the male respondents. okay yeah all right and yeah. then the second uh sample size question was about the dhs and the um the second study yeah. and you know, I was glad when, when you first started to present, I thought, well, but the country, the whole country is not in conflict, only certain yeah. areas are. Yeah, yeah, so I was yeah. glad to see that you had the districts. But then one of the problems with the DHS is that the sample sizes are often so small in the districts. So if you select, I, I was just curious, you know, if you selected out the districts that were conflict affected, that's then great, what do you end up with? That's an amazing question. And so at the end of the day, what we did for each country was district is a generic term. And you probably, it sounds like you know this quite well, there are primary, secondary, and tertiary administrative boundaries, and in every country they have different names. And so what we did was we um, filtered into the administrative boundary that would, first of all would give us enough sample size within it and enough heterogeneity across the country, right? So you can't pick you know, the primary administrative boundary and only have two districts to compare, right? That's not meaningful. Um, and then if you use, um, some kind of denomination where you have 800 districts but only one person in each, that's also not meaningful. So we tried to find the right balance where you get enough sample size and the heterogeneity of exposure to conflict, if, okay. if that makes sense. Great, yeah. And then my last question is the bigger one about your second project. In yeah. terms of looking at violence as measured by the DHS um, post-conflict, wouldn't you need to compare it also with um, IPV or GBV pre-conflict? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's exactly what I'm hoping to do in the future. And so basically saying there are not a ton, but certainly some countries where you have a DHS before a period of conflict and then the DHS after. And I think it would be fascinating. We actually run some, ran some preliminary numbers in Kenya and found that districts that ended up falling into violence were also more likely to be violent against their women beforehand. And so then the question becomes, once you adjust for that, what do we see? I suspect it explains some of it, but the violent districts before become violent during war and probably get even more violent against their women after. I think, and you know, I think this would be fascinating to tell a state like, the more violent your men are towards their women, the more likely it is they're gonna rise up against you as a state. Like, I bet you'd get their attention immediately. Um, so I love that question. It's something we're trying to look at. And one thing that I do wanna note, um, I always kind of balance between how much I go into the research methods, those numbers, the, the odds ratios I presented where women are 50 to 250 times more likely, that was after adjusting for all of the known correlates of intimate partner violence. So that was not a raw number, that was completely adjusted for exposure to childhood violence, you know, wealth level, men's educate, your partner's education level, all of that. And so to see that amount explained over and above everything we know about explaining IPV was striking. Um, my name is Nandita. I'm a recent graduate from the conflict. Oh, sorry. Uh, Nandita from the conflict resolution program at Georgetown. Um, I understand that your study looked at women becoming more vulnerable in conflict affected areas. and But I'm just curious to understand if 
living in these conflict affected areas and not partaking in the violence is mm. also making certain kind of men and other non binary groups more more vulnerable uh, if so are the mechanisms that affect that are making women more vulnerable the same as the ones that would make these other groups also more vulnerable yeah was that are you thinking about kind of what makes men vulnerable to violence against men or what might make men vulnerable to perpetrating violence more often or I was thinking of the first so what might make vi yeah. men also vulnerable to violence so this is a great question and i think this actually speaks to a lot of our biases uh, as researchers and you know, ICRW doesn't suffer from this, but a lot of times, including in the DHS, they only ask victimization questions of women and perpetration questions of men. And that's really frustrating as well, right? Because it's so much harder to look into some of these questions. One of the proxies that we've thought about looking at is um, we do, uh, the DHS does capture information about uh, when you were a child, did you see your father hit your mother? When you were a child, did your father hit you? And um, I think that can begin to provide insights for men as well as women about the levels of violence they might face, especially whether those levels of violence are more elevated during conflict. And then as we all know, you know, kids who are exposed to violence in the home are just thrown into this um, much higher probability of either being a perpetrator or a victim later in life. And, and so you set off this kind of circular, circular um, set of vulnerabilities. So I, I think it's a fascinating question. I also think that there's a role for qualitative work here when you can go into communities and say, you know, the numbers are suggesting that we're seeing this. Could you talk to us about how you think your community changed? How did it change for men? How did it change for women and kids? And, and take it from there. And then Ideally, in the future, you might be able to not draw on the DHS, but to do some kind of population-wide survey to look at this a little bit more explicitly, which I think would be interesting. Shima is well. I work for ICRW, so this is my home. <laughs> <laughs> so the question I wanted to ask, two questions, actually. Uh, I think she's picked on one of them. There is uh, a very wonderful uh, film called Gender Against Men. Yeah. And this is what happens to men in situations of conflict, both whether they are perpetrators or at the receiving end of it. So if they are perpetrators, something happens to men yeah. that also uh, uh, increases their uh, propensity to commit additional, to be more involved in, in violence. If they are also at the receiving end of violence, something also happens to men that increases. Right. Sometimes they feel they have lost something as protectors, they've lost something as providers, they've lost something as people who are rooted. And they, you know, sometimes they let out this anger. This is just one explanation on the people around them. Right. So I think that question she's asking is very important. And there is some body of literature that has explored uh, that issue. That is, that is the first time. That's the first point. Now the second point I wanted some clarity on is um, Liberia, yeah. right? And Kenya, right? Those yeah. are the two, start, yeah. the two sides. Liberia had a very long history of war, protracted over two, three, four years, right? You're referring to Kenya and what happened in the post-election uh, period, isn't it? Yeah. That, that, that violence, I lived in Kenya during that period, it lasted about three months, yeah. right? So you're comparing a place yeah. that saw a long period of conflict, mm -hmm massive almost nationwide mm -hmm. to another place that saw isolated and pockets of of violence in just the um the rift valley region of kenya mm -hmm. so uh, how does that how does that look to you i mean in reflection uh, at this point in time um do you feel that you're comparing oranges with oranges or do you mm -hmm. feel you're comparing an apple with with some tomato yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a great question. So I think the, the short answer is we, I, I, I didn't expect necessarily to find anything in Kenya per se, because it was this incredibly acute, short kind of burst of violence, but really in some ways, as, as you know, seized both national and international attention. Um, one thing I, we'll speak to with this question that I think would be fascinating to look at is 
what is the decay function of how long it takes in theory if you're going to return back to a normal baseline after a conflict how long might that take and one thing i will say is because kenya had that short burst of violence and it just happened that the dhs went in right after because as you said it was so short we saw a one year lag from a small intense burst of violence in kenya and in liberia it was this long, massively protracted civil war, and DHS didn't go in until five years later. And so in Liberia, we we're actually looking much, much, much longer after a conflict, to, but we still saw that heartbeat, right, of, of IPV in the places that experience conflict. So a question I, a sincere question I have as a researcher is, you know, maybe with Kenya, we can say, all right, here's the election violence, here's that one year snapshot. Maybe three years later, we don't we don't see the effect anymore because it was such a quick burst of violence that disappeared. But maybe in Liberia, we'll see those levels of IPV in the conflict affected places, you know, lasting five, 10, 15 years later. I know I'm not describing it super well, but your point is really taken. And I think the nature of violence matters deeply. And I think one thing you could do is construct a multi-country data set and add some of that information in, right? In Kenya, it lasted for three months and um, you know, had this characteristic. In Liberia, violence lasted for almost 10 years with the two successive civil wars and had these kinds of characteristics. So it's all just to say, I mean, it's ripe for, for more and better work because it is so different. And then the first question about kind of men can be vulnerable in some ways when they're both victims and perpetrators. And I know I'm paraphrasing. I mean, I think that point couldn't be more well taken. You know, one of the projects I've worked on for a long time is work with former child soldiers. And the heartbreaking thing there is, you know, they're victims until they're 18 and then they're perpetrators, right? And children have experienced such vast amounts of abuse. And then once they become you know, an aged combatant, they um, are looked at as monsters, but what they've been through is kind of unimaginable uh, for us. And I think just to be able to sit with that complexity and to acknowledge it is so important. And I, I think we have a lot further to come as a field to acknowledge that men can face high levels of trauma and abuse and victimization throughout their lives and how much that feeds into the way that they then process trauma themselves. I'm reminded of an anecdote. One of our, In one of our pieces of work, we looked at why women who are victims of sexual violence in Eastern DRC are so highly stigmatized within their homes to the point where men actually will kick them out. You know, So a husband might tell his wife if she was forcibly raped by combatants that she has to leave the home. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, this is just so incomprehensible, so heartbreaking, so tragic that that woman is just re-victimized again and again. So we did a, a project to talk to male family members who had both decided to support their female relative after rape and decided to kick her out of the home. And, um, you know, I think just the most heart-stopping finding from that was the men who said, I kicked her out because I couldn't look at her. I was so ashamed that I couldn't protect her. And I felt like my role as a husband or brother was to protect her from rape. But the second I fail at that role, I have nothing left to give and we kind of like dissolve the family, right? And I can't live with the trauma of not having been able to help her. And then the women said, we never expected you to protect us. We just expect you to support us afterwards. And you saw this like total disconnect between how people were processing that, um, that healing. And I thought that was one of the most poignant research finding, honestly, of my career, that you know, men weren't trying to behave in, in a monstrous way. They were actually just not equipped to deal with their own traumatic experiences. Um, yeah. On that note, um, no, I think this is, it's such an incredible point and, and it's something that we've found in, in our research, actually in our research about child marriage, but in, in other harmful practices that, that what may look like abuse is in fact a family's efforts to protect their children in, in different ways, whether in their partners and children. And 
Um, if it means taking your child out of the direction of danger, pulling her out of school, taking her off the streets, that's how you protect her from, from attack. Yeah. Anyway, um, and this, and what I also would like to note is that um, as usual, research begets more research questions, which is why we all continue to have jobs. Um, and I really appreciate the questions that you've raised and the questions that you all have raised here. Um, I would like to welcome you to join us for some refreshments and you can talk more to Jocelyn and to each other about the work that you're doing and that we're doing. So thank you all so much for coming today and congratulations again, Jocelyn. Thank you for being with us.